Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to take a look at some of the new aspects of the smoke and pyro solvers in Houdini 12. Now, if you haven't used Houdini before, don't worry, we're going to start from the basics, though it would be useful to have some understanding of volumes in Houdini, and there's a separate tutorial series that I have done on that. Uh, but I am going to go through this step by step, uh, from the start, uh, but as I go along I'll say a little bit about how things have changed from Houdini 11 to Houdini 12. And in fact we're not going to cover the pyro solver in this video, we're going to have a look at it very generally, but I'm going to concentrate on the smoke solver. So first of all, a word or two on what's changed. And the most obvious thing that's changed is we've got all of these new presets for the pyro solver. So let me just lay down one of these because we can then uh, see what uh, what happens. So let's choose, let's say, the flames preset. So I've just selected that with this object selected, and it's it's working out how to construct itself there. And what uh, what we want to do is just play this through, and we can see the flames start to appear. And we can see straight away that uh, this is a much better display in our viewport of the fire effect than we used to get in Houdini 11. Uh, and if we have a look at our network here that's been created, this auto dot network, uh, we have a couple of new elements. The Pyro Solver is broadly the same, although there are some enhancements to the way it calculates noise. Uh, but we have this node here, which is new since Houdini 11. Um, what this does is ensure that the container for our pyro effect expands as the effect itself grows. And we'll cover that in a little bit more detail later in this video. The other thing that's changed here is this source node. We can see that this is sourcing the fuel which is creating the fire. So this is the thing that's converting that sphere into fire. And this is new also for Houdini 12. In Houdini 11, as you may remember, there was a source node which used to sit down here. Now this is a, a sort of sub-solver of the pyro solver, or indeed the smoke solver. Let me just have a very quick look at our sphere object too. And a new thing that's happened here is that part of the process of sourcing our smoke or our pyro effect from an object creates these nodes here in particular this Create Fuel Volume node. And we're going to spend quite a lot of time in this tutorial having a look at how this particular node works. So let me just go back uh, to our simulation and just demonstrate as we go through. We can see, uh, as I step through the simulation, we start with a very small container, and then as our fire starts to expand, we can see the container expanding. The other thing you'll notice is that this is very fast. Now at the moment, let's just uh, have a look. I think this by default has a reasonably small, uh, so the voxel count here, it's 30 by 30 by 30. That's, that's not particularly detailed. So let's just demonstrate how much faster Houdini is for those of you familiar uh, with Houdini 11. So I'm gonna go into my dot network and that's on the pyro solver here. Just take this down to a division size of 0 0.05. So this is now a much more detailed simulation. Uh, let's play it through. We can see how fast it is. And it's going a little bit more slowly than it did before. Uh, but it's no mean, by no means too slow to, to use. It's still going at more or less real time. So let me just rewind this and I'll just show you that uh, we've now got let's see 5 million voxels so it's a pretty detailed simulation that we've got there and it's still running reasonably quickly let me just show you that on the pyro solver here too now and also on the smoke solver you do have this option under the advanced tab to use OpenCL. So this will use your graphics card, if you've got a sufficiently powerful graphics card, to 
help calculate the simulation. Now, in fact, uh, this probably isn't going to speed up your simulation unless you've got a particularly powerful graphics card and you're using a very big simulation. There are also some hints and tips uh, on the Houdini forums about how to maximize the speed using OpenCL. I'm not going to use OpenCL during this, the course of this tutorial, but it is there as a way of accelerating your simulation. The other thing that's new uh, with the PyroSolver, at least, is uh, that we have these new controls under the Shape tab. And we have all of these different ways, dissipation, disturbance, shredding, sharpening, turbulence, and confinement, all of these different ways to shape our simulation. Now, I'm not uh, today going to go through all of these. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to cover them in a future tutorial. We're just going to cover the basics today. So you might say, well, why should we bother to learn the basics when we have all of these fantastic presets? Well, of course, uh, you can only adjust a simulation if you understand how it's put together. And although these presets are good starting points, you're almost certainly going to want to tweak them to get the precisely the effect that you want. So it is important to understand how they're put together. And there are two or three different ways in which these presets are indeed any smoke solver adds variation and interest to the simulation. One of them is through the use of noise uh, here in the shape tab of the PyroSolver. As I say, I'm not going to cover that today. The other one is by using variation in the sourcing. And in fact, by default, this particular preset is using variation in the sourcing. So you vary the density of your source and you vary the, the velocity of the smoke or the flames that are coming out of the source. And that's a key way in which you can give your simulation some interest. And we're going to cover how to achieve that. So I've started now from an empty scene. And let's have a look at how we can construct a smoke simulation. So the first thing you need for a smoke simulation in general is an object for your smoke to, to, to come out of, a, to source from. And I'm going to be a little bit boring and we're going to just use a sphere. So let me lay down a sphere and let's reduce the radius of this down to maybe 0.5. And the next thing I'm going to need is a smoke container. So I'm going to control click the smoke container and I'm going to move it up like so. And I think we can leave it at the default dimensions otherwise. If you want to change the size of your smoke container, container uh, the Y key will toggle between two different manipulators so that you can expand it like so. And you can also move it like so. I'm going to revert it back to defaults. The other thing you'll want to do with your smoke container is decide on how detailed your simulation is going to be. And that's basically to do with the number of divisions in your smoke container. So the number of divisions isn't directly connected to the size. Here the size is 5 by 5 by 5. That doesn't mean that there are five divisions. Uh, in fact, we've, we can set, there are a number of different ways we can set the size of this container. The easiest is to do it by division size. So in this case, because uh, there are each division is 0.2 in size, uh, every unit of length is going to contain five divisions, and so there are going to be 25 divisions in each dimension of this current smoke container. And it's, I think, not visible here. In fact, I, I thought it would be, uh, but that will be 25 by 25 by 25. I'm going to go down, in fact, to a 0 0.05. So uh, we can, in fact, see this when we look inside this node here, the import smoke node. And I should say, by the way, that when we used uh, the shelf tool back then to create our smoke container, the shelf tool laid down two networks. It laid down this autodop network, which is what we were just looking at, and it also lays down this import smoke node. 
The import smoke node is the node that imports the results of your simulation and is the thing that you use to render your smoke. This is the node that actually is rendered. The auto.network is not rendered. Uh, let me dive inside and we can see we've got two nodes in here. Uh, one of which has the render flag on it here and the other watch has the display flag. So what we're seeing at the moment is this node here. The only difference between them is that this node is used for visualization. Uh, this node imports a full range of fields and can be used for rendering. In general, you're not going to need to edit these nodes. You can just leave them at the default. But if you want to see the size of your simulation, one of the ways to do so is to middle click on this node and it will then tell you uh, how big your volume resolution and we can see we've got just density being imported here and that's 100 by 100 by 100 so that's quite big. So as I said a bit earlier the basic uh, principle here is that we're using an object in this case the sphere as the source for our smoke uh, and there are two bits to how that object is converted into smoke. Inside the auto dot network here, let me just hit L to lay this out and zoom in. Ah, in fact, uh, having said that, we haven't we haven't yet used the shelf tool to, to create smoke from this, so let me just select it. And then to convert this into smoke, we can use one of these tools along here. Uh, there's source from surface, source from points, and source from volume. Now, the source from surface will just construct something where the smoke is emitted from the surface of the sphere, not from its whole uh, shape. The source from points is really more useful when you're, for example, emitting from a particle system, and we'll see that in a minute. And uh, the source from volume uses the whole solid volume of this sphere to emit our smoke. So I'm going to, with my sphere selected, select that. And then it's going to invite me to select a fluid box. So let's select the fluid box. And I should say, by the way, that this is an, an early release candidate of Houdini 12. And some of the display things here are not quite working. So this box isn't changing color when I select it. But we can see it is selected here. So I can hit Enter. And we can see a couple of things change immediately. Let's have a look first of all at our network. And we can see that these two nodes over here have been added. So let's have a look and see what they do. The merge node really doesn't do anything. That's just there in case you need to add other nodes in. This is the node that's doing the work. And we can see that it's a source volume node. And this is new in Houdini 12. And we can see that it's sourcing smoke. And then it's got a path here which is pointing at a sphere object. And we'll have a look in a moment at exactly where it's pointing. And then you most of the time won't need to change what's on the rest of this node. All this does is allow you to scale uh, the quantities that you're importing. And in general, when you source from an object, there are three things that you'll want to get from the object. One of which is, is the volume, in other words, the shape of the initial smoke. The other is the temperature. And the temperature, usually through buoyancy, determines how fast your smoke rises up. And then finally, your smoke may inherit some velocity, either because the object is moving or because you want to give some initial velocity to the smoke. And these controls here enable you to change that. This, these detailed tabs down here, I, I'm not going to cover in, in detail now. They allow you to make really quite detailed changes to how uh, your source is going to be used inside your simulation. So I'm not going to cover those right now. Most of the time, you can leave them as they are. So let's go and have a look now at our sphere object. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, what the shelf tool has done when we sourced from the sphere is it's created uh, these nodes here, the create density volume, 
merge in any other volumes. This is just a merge node. It, it, it's not actually doing anything at the moment. And then finally, there's a null at the end, out density. And that's what that uh, node in the dot network is pointing to. So it's grabbing information from here. And what information is it grabbing? Well, we can middle click on this node here. And we can see at the moment, there are two volumes being exported here, density and temperature. So let's select this node and have a look at the controls. And this is a very, really quite a complicated node. And I'm going to go through much, if not all, of this, of the controls here. But once you understand the, the basic principles, it's not too difficult to follow. So the first tab here, this Scalar Volumes tab, let me just enlarge this. The Scalar Volumes tab is about how your geometry is being converted into two fields, density and temperature. Now the conversion is identical for both fields, uh, but you might want to increase the temperature, or you could use some operation later on in your network to for example, add more noise to the temperature than to the density. Or you could even use two of these nodes and then merge together separate density and temperature volumes. So let's just have a look at what uh, what this is doing. And in order to be able to, to look at it properly, I'm going to hide other objects. And we can see that what we're getting is this sort of noisy, smoky sphere shape. And what's going on here? Well, we're creating two fields, in fact, and we're visualizing both of them. And we can turn off the visualization here. So let me turn off both. We can see we get nothing. Uh, and we can actually decide to delete one of these fields. So we could decide we don't need the temperature field. We can just delete it here. Uh, in general, it's best to leave both of them being created. So the first tab here is determining the detail level of your object. How detailed is the volume that this object is being converted into? And you can set this as before with a value which determines the division size. The next tab uh, lets you determine how to visualize the volume that's being created. Now you can set how it's visualized up here. So in both cases here we're visualizing it using smoke. I'm going to turn off the visualization of temperature and let's change this first of all to ISO surface and we can see that this creates a 3D surface from our object and then there's a slice and the slice is often the most useful way of visualizing a source because it allows you to see more clearly the effects of noise and so on. So this is a slice. Each of these little squares here represents a division of our volume. Now obviously we're not seeing the full volume, what we're seeing is a is a slice through it and here on the visualization tab we can move that backwards and forwards through our volume and see the result. We can also change the coloration here, it's usually not necessary to do so. In this case I'm using infrared, so blue means there's empty space, there's nothing there. Red means there's a fully dense emitter, the, the source is fully dense where this, this red color is, and green means something in between. This next tab here determines how your object is going to be converted into, into the volume. And it's called SDF uh, because what in fact is being created here is a signed distance field. That's what the S, D and F stand for. We don't need to worry now exactly what that uh, means. The, the, the video on volumes explains that a bit. Uh, but we do need to have a look at these controls. And what we've got here are some controls which allow us to determine the shape of our source. And I should say straight away that at the moment in the, in the version of Houdini that I'm using there's a bit of a bug because although I used the Source from Volumes tab, we can see that we're really just getting the outside of this sphere. We're not getting the inside at all. And the reason is that 
uh, and I think this is a bug, when we use this shelf tool, the empty interior tick box is selected, which means that the inside of our sphere is going to be empty. If I turn that off, we can see that this is now uh, filled up. I'm just going to leap over here to the Noise tab, and I'm going to turn off using Noise so that we can see our sphere as a complete object. So you can do a couple of things to vary how your object is, is converted into volume. Uh, you can uh, decide to feather the outer edge. So let me just increase this and we can see what this does. This sort of smooths out the edge so that we get a much smoother transition from where the object is to where it isn't. That's this green space here. And you can indeed uh, use a ramp to feather to determine the how this actually works. We can see that there. You can also feather inward. Uh, so if we have an empty interior, uh, let me just revert this to defaults. So if we have an empty interior, uh, we can feather the inside as well. So this would fill in the inside like so. And again, you can determine the profile of that using this curve here if you want. These two tick boxes up here, I'm not going to cover in detail right now. The scale by source attribute is useful when you're, for example, uh, wanting to paint uh, fuel attributes onto an object. I'm not going to go into that now. We might cover it in a later tutorial. So that's the basics of how uh, this object is going to be converted into a volume. The stamp points tab, as you can see, is, is blanked out. That's because we're converting an object rather than points. Uh, and we can say it's build SDF from geometry as opposed to stamp points. If, if it was stamp points, that would be enabled. We're going to go into this a little bit uh, later on when we look at sourcing from a pop network. Then here's the, the center, really, of, of how you vary your source, which is the Noise tab. And uh, This is new in Houdini 12. This whole new node, node is uh, new in Houdini 12. Uh, but this is a very useful way of adding noise. Now there are two types of noise uh, which are combined and they're combined according to the uh, settings here on these two controls. So let me first of all turn down the cell noise and look at the turbulence noise. Turbulence noise is, is pretty familiar uh, from uh, previous versions of Houdini. You'll, you'll know what it looks like. It's the sort of cloudy type of noise and the, the standard controls here. You can either add uh, this noise to your existing volume or you can multiply. Uh, in general uh, the add method subtracts where the noise is negative and obviously adds where it's positive. Uh, the multiplicative noise just uh, multiplies by the scale of the noise. I'm going to leave it on additive. So let's now take that down to zero. We can see we get back to our original. Let me just turn off empty interior. So that's more realistic. Uh, well that's, that's what it looks like when the interior is, is solid. Turn that off. And let's have a look at cell noise. Uh, and we can see uh, that cell noise is this more chunky uh, noise. It's also known as uh, Voronoi noise and it's the noise which in shaders is used to produce things like uh, reptile scales. So it produces these sort of chunks. These are actually three-dimensional chunks. Let's see whether we can show that. Let me change this back to smoke or maybe even isosurface. And perhaps we can see with this isosurface, you can see this sort of has this chunks cut out of it here. So that's what the cell noise is doing. So by experimenting with these noises, and you can you can scale them and so on, uh, you can get a, a very nice effect for how you want your initial smoke or fire to look. 
let me revert this back to the slice and I'll just show you scaling these cells. You can see we increase them, reduce them, and so on. The other thing that's important here is the pulse duration. Let me just revert these back to defaults while we look at that. And the pulse duration determines how fast the noise changes over time. And I'm just going to turn off simulation because I don't want to slow this down. So with a pulse duration of 1, we can see that as we scrub through, the noise changes like so. If we increase the pulse duration, then the noise changes much more slowly. And if we decrease it, say, to 0.2, it changes much more rapidly. And actually, it's this pulse duration that often has the most profound effect on how your smoke looks when it is emitted, because a, a rapidly changing noise in your source is going to produce a more dramatic change in the shape of your smoke as it's emitted. So that's enough theory. Uh, let's have a look and see what this looks like in practice. So let me switch on uh, Solver. And let's start by getting rid of the noise completely. Uh, let me turn this back to visualization using smoke. And I'm going to turn off this object here so that we can't see it. And then, then dive into the Autodep network. And let me just home this so that we can see a little bit better. And let's let's play the, the simulation. And we can see the first thing that happens is, is rather surprising, which is what appears to be happening is our smoke is falling down and falling out of our container. And this is a difference between Houdini 11 and Houdini 12. And the reason for it is, if we have a look on our smoke solver, the default buoyancy, which is the thing that lifts smoke up when it's hot, has a value of 5. But of course it's being affected by gravity, which is dragging it down with a value of 9. So I think I'm going to disable gravity, and that should allow us to see our smoke progress. So we can now see that our smoke is moving up in a very uniform, neat way. And we can see that's a rather a boring simulation. So let me turn it off and rewind it. And let's have a look and see how we can make this a little bit more interesting. Well, as we said earlier, one of the ways we can make it more interesting is to add noise. So let's do that. Let's leave this at the defaults. I'm going to maintain it as animated. And let's give it a pulse duration of, say, 0.8. And let's have a look and see what this looks like. Ah, and of course I won't be able to see it because I'm in the, the source here. So let's go back to the auto.network. And we can see that that's now producing a much more interesting simulation with much more realistic smoke. It's creating these swirls as the source varies over time. So that's already much more interesting than it was. So that's one of the two ways in which to add interest to our source. The other very powerful way to add interest to our source is to change the velocity of the smoke coming out of it. And we can change the velocity without actually having a moving source. And we can do it here on the second tab of our fluid source node, which is converting the sphere into volumes. So what I'm going to do actually is turn off the noise so that we can see just the effect of changing the velocity. And those of you who are familiar with Houdini 11 and who have seen some of my videos will know that one of the things that you could do in Houdini 11 is add a varying velocity using chops. 
and you can still do that in Houdini 12. You can go on to the velocity tab here and you can see that this is creating a velocity volume and you can add a velocity to your source. Now this is not actually going to cause your source to move, it's just adding a velocity to the smoke that's being emitted. So let me show you how to override this with some noise. This is going to be off the video screen but I'm using a motion effect here and I'm going to select noise and we can see that we immediately get to change the noise. I'm going to in fact make it quite small uh, and then I'm going to go into the network here. I don't want to vary the noise in the y direction so I'm just going to add a delete here and I'm going to delete. Now let's just middle click here and see what our channels are called. They're called VELX, VEL Y and VEL Z. So if I delete star VEL Y what I should find is I have two channels left. This is out of, let me just move this up. Uh, we can see we now just have X and Z. Uh, just briefly running over what this chop network is doing. What this is doing here, this channel node is bringing in the original values of our parameter. And then obviously deleting one of the three channels that's been brought in. So I've just got the X and Z. Uh, this is a noise here. This is creating three separate noise channels. Let me just bring up a, whoops, a motion view so that we can visualize this. We can see we're getting three separate noise channels. This seed parameter here is rather the um, channel parameter here is, is automatically creating the right number of noise channels. One for each of the channels we're importing. And we can vary the amplitude of the noise, we can vary the period and so on. And then this final node here is just adding to each channel the relevant noise channel here. So we're getting, as we can see, these three channels. Now, because this has got the export flag enabled, it's sending this back and it's overriding the values here. We can see they're overridden because they're orange. Again, that's enough theory. Let's see what it looks like in practice. So, uh, well, first of all, we can see that we're getting this, this odd set of lines here. This is, in fact, visualizing our velocity. Now, because our velocity is all heading in one direction, uh, that's not telling us anything very useful. So I'm going to turn off the visualization. Let's go back to our auto.network. And let's have a look and see what this does. So what we should see is over time, there we are, we can see that the smoke is now moving to the left and to the right. And again, that's creating a, a more interesting simulation than the plane simulation we had earlier on. Well, the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is an even more complex way or sophisticated way of adding vol velocity to the smoke emitted from your volume. So let's go back to our source object and I'm going to get rid of uh, this motion effects network uh, and that is by deleting that network. In fact let me just, let me not delete it, let me show you how to get rid of it without deleting it. So this is overridden. What I can do is go to motion effects and this is off the screen but there's a little box here, enable effect and I just turn that off and we can see we go back to our originals. And I'm going to just disable that, we're not going to add velocity. So what's the rest of this velocity and what these velocity controls doing? Well the method of gathering velocity information relies on stamping points and what this is about is collecting the velocity of your source and transferring it to 
the smoke. And your object can have two different types of velocity. It can have a velocity which is applied at the object level, so an animation. And then it can have the object itself changing shape, a deformation. And what this does is it looks for an attribute called V on the points of your object and uses that to determine the velocity that will be added to your smoke. And there are various ways you can create this, this attribute V and we may have a look at some of those later on. But there are also some other ways to create velocity. We can here add the object motion. So if, for example, I'd animated, and we'll see this in a moment, if I'd animated my source, then selecting this will add that motion to my source. We can add a vortex. I'm not going to cover that in this tutorial. Uh, and we can also add curl noise. And curl noise is the is very useful. It's new in Houdini 12, so let me select that. I'm going to turn back on visualization because we will see something very interesting. And we can see now this extremely complex set of lines. And this is trying to visualize the velocity, the random velocity that's now being added to our velocity. So this smoke is going to come out in all sorts of weird directions. I'm going to turn down this maybe to 0.4. Let's see. And I increase the size of the swirl. So we're getting slightly less violent motion. And again, we can uh, animate it. And this is this is going to be animated as we as we go through by default. So we can see that over time this velocity is, is changing. And this velocity is going to be added to our smoke. So let me turn off the visualization again. And let's go to our auto.network and have a look and see what this looks like now. Let's zoom out a little bit. And we can see that this is producing an amazingly complicated motion as the smoke inherits all of those different velocities. And it's this ability to add curl noise combined with the new noise controls in the PyroSolver that's really at the heart of the presets and the much more sophisticated smoke effects that you can now create with Houdini. So that's covered uh, the basics of the fluid source node. Uh, I'm going to go on and have a look now at a moving source and how that affects both the source node and to look in a bit more detail at this resize container node that we haven't yet covered. So let's go on and have a look at a moving source and then once we've done that uh, we'll have a look at sourcing from points or a particle network.